Today's video is going to focus on two problems from different Putnam years, each of which appeared as the second problem on the first part of the exam. So the first problem is a double integral of e to the maximum of b squared x squared, a squared y squared, dy dx. So the first thing we'll do is draw the region of integration, which is this rectangle here that has vertices 0, 0, a, b, and then other two corresponding vertices. Now the thing that's weird with this is the exponent of e. Let's look at when b squared x squared is actually the maximum. So this is when b squared x squared is greater than or equal to a squared y squared. Right, and since our values are all positive, this is the same as saying that bx is greater than or equal to a y. All right, it was given in the problem that a and b are actually positive numbers themselves. So let's split the region of integration by looking at this line that goes through the diagonal of the rectangle that is the region of integration. This line has the equation y equals b a over x, b over a x. So the region where b x is greater than or equal to a y is actually this red region right over here. Now the region where the other inequality holds is actually this purple region here. And so we can focus just on the integral over the red region by the symmetry of the function over the square to say that the integral then is going to be the integral over that triangle t of e to the b squared x squared dy or dA where a is the region of integration being that triangle. Okay, so let's actually compute that integral. We get the integral um, of e to the b squared x squared dA. The region of integration we need to break up into what the bounds are. Okay, um, so we can let our x variable range from 0 to a. And then when we have a fixed x variable, we need to ask where the y variable ranges. And it'll go from 0 up until wherever this line is. When you have a fixed x, the y value is b over ax. And so you get the integral from 0 to b over ax of e to the b squared x squared uh, dy dx. And it's a good idea to do the dy integral first because you can't integrate e to the x squared um, by elementary means. Integrating with respect to y will give us a factor that allows us to do a substitution. So we get the integral from 0 to a of b to the a e to the b squared x squared dx and then multiply by that x factor. Um, okay, so now we can actually integrate this with a substitution. Doing that, we'll get, uh, because we have a b squared x squared in the exponent, um, the derivative of that is a 2b squared x that allows to do substitution. But we have to remind ourselves that our integral is actually twice the integral over the triangle by the symmetry with the other triangle on top less blank. So if we actually do this, let's pull the 1 over a out, we get the integral from 0 to a of 2bx e to the b squared x squared dx. Okay, and then we can actually find the integral for this using, again, the fact that the exponent's derivative is um, given to us there. We have this extra b that we need to take care of. So we get 1 over a times the evaluation from 0 to a of e to the b squared x squared. Um, but then we have this extra factor of uh, b when we actually differentiate the function e to the b squared x squared. Uh, so we need to make sure to have a 1 over b over here. Okay, and so if we do the evaluation, we get uh, a simplified form of 1 over ab uh, times the quantity e to the a squared b squared minus 1. And I think a moral of this integral is that maximum thing really could throw you off. Just break it up into pieces and take it one by one. Okay, so definitely a problem that is uh, a little more delicate to handle than a typical A1 on a Putnam, um, but it's still manageable once you think of breaking that maximum thing up. Okay, the next problem is from the 1993 Putnam, and it's also number A2. Um, and the question asks to prove that if you have a sequence where the square of the nth term minus 
the product of the term before it and the term after it is one, regardless of what term you pick, then the sequence actually satisfies a linear recurrence equation like the one given here with the constant a. So how do you actually establish something like this? Um, it's not clear what to do at first, but one of the things you want to do is hopefully prove the recurrence relation holds inductively by figuring out what xn plus 2 is explicitly. And you can do that by using the given condition to offset the indices and say that xn plus 1 squared minus xn times xn plus 2 is xn squared minus xn minus 1 xn plus 1. So you can actually rearrange to figure out what xn plus 2 is in terms of xn and xn minus 1 and xn plus 1, and hopefully that'll help you be able to inductively get the recurrence. So if we rearrange, we get xn plus 2 is xn plus 1 all squared minus xn squared plus xn minus 1 times xn plus 1, all divided by the factor xn. Okay, so now we can substitute in for xn plus 1 what we have in the recurrence equation. We have axn minus xn minus 1 all squared minus xn squared and then minus xn minus 1 times, again using the recurrence equation, axn minus xn minus 1. And this is all going to be divided by xn itself. All right, so great. Um, now let's do the expansion. We get a x or a squared x n squared minus two copies of a x n x n minus one plus x n minus one squared. Um, and then I'm going to take the minus n squared here that we have extra, and then we have adding in a x n x n minus one, and then finally we have the minus x n minus one all squared and we divide all of that by xn. Okay, so we can subtract off these terms here, um, and then notice what we're left with is uh, some expression involving xn and xn minus one. So first we get a squared xn, dividing by that xn, and then each of these other terms has an xn factor that leaves us with a minus axn minus one, and then finally, the minus xn squared becomes xn. Factoring out that a, we get a times xn minus xn minus 1, subtracting xn. And then now, by our recurrence equation, that thing in the parentheses is actually xn plus 1. So we do inductively get that xn plus 2 satisfies the same linear recurrence equation. So by induction, this recurrence, linear recurrence equation is actually satisfied for some value of a.